Okay, just about one more minute um, before we'll get started here. Okay, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us at um, Northern Kentucky History Hour. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you. Um, I'm your host for tonight, Heather Cook. Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum. Barringer Crawford Museum is supported in part by the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, Arts Wave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph B. Hale Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining us for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Um, it's really great. Um, you can bring your family up here. Kids love it. Adults love it. I would really recommend it. You really become part of our Barringer Crawford family here. Um, before we begin, we can go over a few reminders. Uh, everyone's microphone has been muted when you joined um, tonight but you can have your video on if you prefer. The reason the microphone is muted is so that we don't distract from the presentation. But if you do choose to have your video on, others on the call are able to see you even when the screen is being shared. So you can have it on if you would like. Um, if you have a question or comment to share during the presentation, please type it in the chat and we will try to get to as many questions as possible immediately following the presentation. Also, there will be a trivia question tonight. The first person to answer correctly in the chat will receive a Northern Kentucky History Hour pin. Um, so let's meet tonight's speaker. Uh, Janine Kreimbrink is president and senior archeologist with K&V Cultural Resources Management. Uh, she's a board member of Friends, of Friends of Big Bone and a past board member of the James A. Ramage Civil War Museum and archaeologist associate at the Barringer Crawford Museum. Um, Janine, welcome. Hi, I am so glad to be back and welcome back everyone. Uh, hopefully uh, tonight will be interesting. I know it's something that I really love. So the screen has been shared. Let me go ahead and turn the um, slideshow on so we're looking at it well hello there we go one can see that can everybody see that you can unmute you can see that right okay yes okay excellent all right so if your walls could talk what stories would they share i've got um a couple different things to talk about some uh one wow moment Anyway, to uh, share, and I have uh, one very interesting one. I also have kind of a caveat educational one that we're going to talk about as well. And I have, come on, sorry, I'm trying to get my screen to go to the next slide. There we go. All right. We could do an hour on each individual list on this page. We obviously don't have time to do that. So what I'm gonna to try to do tonight is use two main examples of, of interesting projects and then talk about how I got there uh, to find the information that I did uh, and the resources that I used. And with this being on, gonna be on YouTube, you can always go look there to see the links uh, that I put up here on the screen uh, once we get to that point. I do wanna talk about deeds for a minute. We're gonna come back to those. Uh, in current deeds, and if you're gonna research your house, you always start from the present and work your way backwards uh, to try to get to the older deeds. Well, to do the in-person research or do the modern deeds, you have to either go to the courthouse or you have to pay online because pretty much all modern deed history um, records are behind paywalls, at least in Kentucky. If you're lucky and you live or you want to research a house in Warren County, Ohio, they're the gold standard as far as I'm concerned because it's all free and you can research deeds on uh, the Warren County 
um, clerk's office website all the way back to 1800. Um, they've scanned pretty much everything up there. So that's kind of the gold standard. Uh, around here though, locally, uh, they're all behind a paywall for the modern deeds. Uh, or you can go in person for free to the courthouses. You just have to remember that different courthouses are in different places, right? Kenton, Campbell, and Boone County all now have three courthouses, or two courthouses each in each of the three counties, Independence and um, Covington, Alexandria, and Newport, and Burlington and Florence. So the modern, we don't have time to talk about. Sometime we can do a tutorial perhaps on how to start and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, census records, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And these two and uh, city directories and maps, we're going to talk about those as well. I want to start with some examples. The first one that I want to talk about, though, is, is an important example and a caveat, kind of an educational caveat. When you go to research the history of your house, it might not always be pleasant. It might not always be what you expect. It might be something uh, unexpected, something unpleasant. And uh, the one short example, we're going to spend a lot of time on it tonight, uh, would be for another talk, is that the secrets of our houses are not always happy. Be prepared when you look into the past. What you find may be unexpected. Evidence of deed covenants, slavery, criminal activity may all turn up as part of the history of your house. And all these things are important and historically significant. Um, they're not always what you expect. Uh, this particular picture is actually the house I grew up in. And when I was doing the deed history on it, I found that it has a deed covenant in it. And deed covenants, uh, there are a lot of different kinds of deed covenants, but the one we're talking about are ones that were embedded in property deeds all over the country. And their purpose was to keep people who were not white from buying land. Throughout the 1920s, 30s and 40s at least, and, and in some places up through the 50s, restrictive covenants Stating municipal demographics. So they essentially pushed people into certain neighborhoods and kept people out of neighborhoods. And in this particular case, this was in Ellesmere, and the deed on this house had a deed covenant on it from when it was built in the 19 teens up until the early 1950s. Yeah, I was very surprised. Um, when I found it. And so just keep in mind that when um, you go to research your property or your house, house, that you may not always find um, what you think you're going to find. So we will move on. All right. So now this next one is, I think it is now my new favorite house and my new favorite. Um, research project because it's still ongoing. We're actually in the middle of it. So I'm not gonna necessarily tell you exactly where this is located, but uh, we're gonna take a look at this house and I'll give you all a second or two to just look at it and see if, if you can get some sort of idea of what's interesting about this house. Um, I, as soon as I walked up the driveway and started looking at it, I got very excited and very happy. And then I started thinking, oh, wow, is this what I really think it is? And so we'll go to the next slide and we'll start exploring that a little. So when you look at this house, when you look at the roof line, you're going to see a break in the roof line right here. And it has two front doors. So here's a front door. Here's a front door on the porch. It's covered right now in vinyl siding and a shingle roof. It has a stone and brick chimney on either end. Very interesting. 
house and we go to the next slide and there's a log house in there. So inside this house is a log house and, and I walked up to the on the front porch and I looked in the windows and I looked at the depth of the window wells on this side of the house, this window right here is almost a foot deep. So you can see how deep that window well is. The window well on this side of the house where my arrow is pointing is only about six inches deep or a regular standard window well depth um, that you might see from a frame house or wood, wood frame house. And so I called the um, client, my client, and I said, I need to talk to the landowner. And I called the landowner and I said, is there a log house in there? And they said, yes, there is. And it's a one room over one room. So this heat room and this room are log. And this side of the house is framed. And we got proof of that. We were allowed to take off a little bit at this point in time, a little bit of a corner. And you can see the log framing here. And these logs are at least 12 to 15 inches tall. So very large. Uh, logs uh, from a log house. And here's the log part and the back is an addition. Uh, later, here's the other, the break in the roof um, right there. So it got very, very interesting and started looking at it and thinking about it and then we went to the courthouse and I'm going to skip back to 1920 for privacy reasons. Um, and for deeds current back to the 1920, depends on the county. As I said before, you have to go to the courthouse to look up those deeds. Uh, most back to the 1980s are online or on computers at courthouses. Uh, but online access is generally behind a paywall. Family Search is a, the best online source uh, for old deeds, and it's free. Um, and uh, hold on here. We tell you about that as soon as I get my other computer to behave itself. All right, so in Kenton County um, on Family Search, they have all of Kenton County deeds for both Independence and Covington from 1901 back. In uh, Covington deeds start in 1860, Independence deeds start in 1840. Before that, before 1840, you have to go to Campbell County because the county was before 1840. Family Search has Boone County deeds from 1799 to 1914. Campbell County has two sets of deeds, uh, Alexandria and Newport. Alexandria from 1795 to 1912. And Newport, 1863 to 1919. And those are all online. And a little bit later, I want to take you through the steps of getting to that information on family search. So to get back to this particular property in 1920 and 1917, it changed hands several times. Uh, and in uh, 1917, a woman named Leona Stevens sold it to uh, people named Turner. And Leona Baker Stevens inherited the land from her father, W.H. Baker. And Leona's husband was Jeff D. Stevens. And at least by 1910, they lived in Erlanger on Commonwealth Avenue uh, and owned this property out, uh, outside of town. And um, her father, W.H. Baker, bought the land in 1898 uh, for a man named Jacob Rice. And Jacob Rice got it from his father, Caleb Rice, in uh, 1885. And that was 152 acres at that particular time. This is a map of 1914 of Kenton County, and I'll show you where to find this online in a little while. Um, at the Covington Library has it. And here you can see the property with the red arrow pointing to the house. And uh, J.D. Stevens, Jeff D. Stevens is listed as the owner. And here are, here's another rice that still lives in the area. And Julia Harrison um, was also a rice and the Buffingtons had bought the land from the Rices. So this is 1914, so it confirmed our deed history. So we keep going backwards. 
1883, this is the 1883 atlas, and I'll show you where to find that as well. Uh, Jacob Rice is listed as the house uh, occupant and owner, and here's his father, Caleb, down here. The roads all are very different today than they were back then. So Caleb Rice, the Rices were an interesting family we don't have time to talk about. But between 1831 and 1878, Caleb Rice made approximately 41 land purchases, all in this vicinity. Uh, he combined the land into one large farm of upwards of 700 acres. And later in life, he began to divide up the land among his children. And he gave um, 152 acres in so this area all over here to his son, Jacob. And this is from deed book 46, page 120. And if it says KI, that means Kenton County Independence. Or if it says KC, for example, that would be Kenton County Covington. So that's uh, 1880s. So many of Caleb's purchases were smaller parcels of six to 30 acres. And one group of purchases um, was of land owned by a man named John McGlasson. McGlasson died in 1832, and Caleb Rice bought up all of the pieces broken out by McGlasson's probate. So after John McGlasson died, the land got divided up among his children uh, with land uh, retained for his wife's use until her death. And one of those deeds in particular uh, is, is uh, of interest to us because it mentions a house and a lane or a, a farm lane. And this excerpt is from McGlasson's will. And if you can read it, let me see here. John McGlasson, um, this is uh, talking about the edges of his land. Running with said lane, so as to include the buildings or houses occupied by said John McGlasson, deceased at the time of his death, as his residence, and thence to Dr. Eubanks' line, et cetera, et cetera. Um, reserving. Uh, a forest said and said land, the life estate of said widow. So his widow's name was Nancy, and we'll get to that here in a minute. So uh, Caleb Rice is buying up all this land from John McGlasson. Um, and so let's go back and talk about John McGlasson. And let me call exciting news for us as we're doing the research. John McGlasson is a Revolutionary War veteran. He was born in 1767, uh, he died in 1832, and Nancy McGlasson, his wife, was born in 1767, and they lived in Buckingham County, Virginia, uh, in the 18th century. John served as a private in the Army of the United States during the Revolutionary War between 1780 and 1781. He was wounded at the Battle of 96 in South Carolina, and uh, this is a uh, uh, front page of his um, pension application, uh, which I will also show you how to find. Uh, you can look up pension applications online as well. They were married in about 1785, and they lived in Virginia through the 1810. So they're still in Virginia in the 1810 census. Based on ancestry records, they had 10 children uh, born between 1786 and about 1802. And they moved to Kentucky and purchased 228 acres uh, in our project area vicinity on July 27, 1819, which is in a Campbell County deed book from the heirs of a man named Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson was one of the first landholders uh, in this vicinity. The Dean mentions Benjamin Rice as an adjacent landowner who was Caleb's father. This is the same property uh, where the log house is situated um, based on a lot of different computations and, and figuring things out. We're confident that it's the same piece of property. And in 1820, John uh, is listed as a person over age 45. There's one uh, young man, 16 to 25. White females, one under 10, two 10 to 16, one 26 to 45. Uh, this is Nancy, but she was actually uh, 53. One enslaved male, uh, 14 to 26, and one enslaved female, 26 to 45. And so they were farming on the property. 
1830, this is an image of the 1830 census. Um, there are four children, uh, presumably their grandchildren, one adult male and female, um, and then uh, John and Nancy. So we're figuring that uh, the married son or daughter uh, and their children were living with them. I couldn't find any information on whether there were enslaved persons living there in, in 1830. Right. In 1832, he had applied for his Revolutionary War pension in 1830 and um, was given a partial disability for that. Um, it provides very important information. Pension records can be a wealth of information if, if an ancestor served in the military and you can find a pension record. Nancy continued to re receive a pension after his death. Uh, until it records her death in um, 1846. A family history on, that I found online notes that two children, Rhoda and James, moved to Grant County after their marriages. And um, the pension record states that Nancy moved to John, uh, moved to Grant County, and presumably she was living with her children. And this scenario fits with the fact that her children sold all or most of their land along Bullock Penn Creek to Caleb Rice starting in the 1830s. Nancy McGlass and Crook and her husband Benjamin sold 30 acres to Caleb Rice on May 10th, 1837. As we already noted, this deed mentions a house in the lane. This is also referenced in John McGlasson's will. He left everything to his wife, Nancy, for her lifetime and after her death to be divided among her children. And this is a quote um, from his will. He gives to his daughter, Nancy, wife of Benjamin, 30 acres um, of land. And it mentions the house where he's then living uh, in, uh, when he died in 1832. And this is the same 30 acres of land that was Nancy's dower. So it was the land that she had um, until she died, but she signed off her dower rights and allowed them to sell all the land to Caleb Rice. So why is this so exciting? We're gonna come back to that at the very, very end, but that leads us to our trivia question. And here's the trivia, trivia question. How many standing log houses are known in Kenton County? And I'll say, because there are probably more, but standing log houses that are documented in Kenton County. Is it A, 42, B, 6, or C, 18? And we'll come back to that uh, shortly uh, when we get to the end. All right. So how did I find all of that information? Um, and we're gonna go look here at Family Search. I've got some screenshots here. And Family Search is free, but you have to set up a login so that you can log in, uh, but it is free, there's no charge. Then once you set yourself up with a login, you have all these choices of things to search from when you go to their main page. And to find deeds, the important one is the catalog right here. And so you click on catalog and it says search the catalog of genealogical materials, including books, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, online and in libraries. And you get a choice of choosing anything just online or at the family history center or a family history center. And so I always choose online. And when you're searching, it's very important to remember to put United States first comma the state, comma the county. And, and you can keep going from there, but um, if you try to search for say Kenton County, it won't find it. You have to start with the United States and then the state and then the county. And then it will take you to a list of all of the things that they have online from Kenton County. And it's an amazing amount of information that they have scanned. Um, and this is all through the, the Mormons or the Church of uh, Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. And then and it gives you note. It says 1840, created from Campbell. There are two courthouses. 
So it even reminds you of that. And then you look at all of the lists. You can find Bible records, cemeteries, census records, church records, guardianship, history, land and property uh, is the one that uh, takes us to the deeds, indexes, maps, et cetera, naturalization and citizenship, probate. So then you were gonna, you're gonna click on land and property. Now this one, I happen to click on Boone County, but it's the same. And then it takes you to the page and it lists oops, all your different choices. So you can run down through the deed books, you can run through the indexes. And as long as you see this little camera, that means you can look at the actual document. And here, for example, um, are many pages from just, I clicked on one of the deed books. Uh, actually, I think this is an index. And you can click on any page you want. For example, here's a general index to deeds, and it gives you the book and the page number. Once you know that book and the page number, you go back out to the list of deeds and find the book that you want. Okay. And you can look at those deeds. It's amazing. You can zoom in, you can move it around, uh, you can download it onto your computer uh, so that you can save them. And the same situation goes for um, military records. Uh, and this one is through, I got to through Ancestry, um, but uh, uh, there's one called Fold3 that always confuses me. And I always go to the library if I want to work on Fold3, which has military records and is a great resource. It's a little complicated. Um, so we're going to go to Ancestry here in a minute. Um, there's a, a blog online, and I put this on her. So once it's on YouTube or whatever, you can go find this. But it's a link, and it's called Using Revolutionary War Pension Files to Find Family Information. Great little resource. Uh, and there's the link. This is an actual copy of the handwritten text from John's pension record. He got $4 a month pension starting 1830. Uh, he had a healed bullet wound from that battle. And Nancy received $60 a year starting in 1839 until her death in 1946. It's amazing amount of information that talks about where they lived in Virginia when they moved to Kentucky. It lists their children. It talks about what battles he was in. Was he injured or not injured? Um, it, interviews people that knew them to confirm that yes, she was his wife, for example, after they died. It, amazing amounts of information. So to get to there, uh, if you go to Ancestry and if you don't wanna pay for a subscription to it, um, you can go to the library and use it for free. Any of the libraries around here subscribe to Ancestry and you can get onto it there. And you go to search and you can choose military records, put in your person's name and any information you know about them. And then you hit search. And there it is. U.S. Revolutionary War Pension and Bounty Land Warrant Application Files. And you can view John's records or whoever if they're in there. Um, pretty straightforward way to find military records. All right. So we're going to leave um, the McGlassons for a few minutes. And it's almost 7 o'clock, so we're doing pretty good. Uh, we're going to talk about one that has, has been one of my favorites projects that I've worked on, uh, houses um, to research. And the subtitle on this one is, wow, that's a lot of tenants. Well, if you've seen uh, one of my urban archaeology digs, I may have talked about this particular house, um, but I find it fascinating. So here's the house right here. Um, it is, hold on. Um, it's an Italianate two-story house with an asymmetrical door placement. 
I had a side gabled roof with one visible chimney, um, the decorative brackets in the corner, so nicely decorated uh, with these little tiny attic windows up on the third uh, floor attic. Uh, it's very interesting side passageway where you go all the way through the backyard um, and uh, the main door was actually in this passageway. And we'll talk in a minute about the guy who built the house. Um, and it's very possible that he built other similar ones. There's one right over on um, um, Robbins, I think. Uh, this is a 1048 Green Up, or was a 1048 Green Up, no longer there. Uh, anyway, this house, could he may have built other ones in Covington. They were very similar to this one. So a uh, two-story house, and you can see not very big uh, in width. It's really one room wide, uh, several rooms deep. Here's the main deed history for this particular house. So City of Covington bought it in 1979. It's part of, uh, it was in front of the Jacob Price houses and is now part of that uh, redevelopment of that property, but it became a park in 1980 on the corner of 11th and Greeno. So it goes back through a couple of different uh, landowners, um, Harold and Susie Masterson, Roy and Ethel Reed, and the Mastersons bought it from a woman named Rose Gessiness, and she inherited it from her husband, Benjamin Gessiness, and um, he acquired it in 1921 from Harry and Tilly Siegel. And the Siegels acquired it in uh, 1913 from Elizabeth Carr. And Elizabeth Carr is the daughter of a man named Joseph Rusha or Rush. And his will was written in 1902 and filed with the clerk in 1907. And Elizabeth was his daughter. And look at this time frame. Joseph bought it, the land, in 19, 1853, and he built the house there in 1853, and he was a builder and a contractor. So it's very possible that he built some of the other similar houses in this part of Covington. He bought it from Daniel and Marianne Hall in 1851, and they got it part of the um, platting by the Western Baptist Theological Institute of this part of Covington. So Joseph Rush and his family owned the property from 1853 to 1907. And you might assume that they lived there that entire time, but it becomes very interesting when we look at the evolution of this house and who actually lived there. So in 1877, this is the house. Um, he had two lots parts of two lots. And this is 1048 Greena. This is 11th Street down here where my arrow is waving. And this is Greena here. And this is 1052, 1054, and 1056 Greena Street. So this is a list of different owners and occupants and renters of these different houses. And in 1048 Green Up Street, Rush was a German Catholic family. They owned it from 1850 to about 1913 when his daughter finally sold it. He was a builder and a contractor. He had multiple borders and occupants over the years. The occupation of the renters included stone cutters, cigar makers, clerks, a dressmaker, a washerwoman, iron and wire workers, and other laborers. And the landowner lived there off and on through these decades. And in the 20th century, it was owned by shoemakers and shoe repairmen. Uh, that's the Seagulls and uh, Mr. Gessiness. The next house over uh, had a succession of owners. And we see that they kind of flop back and forth between Irish, English, and German over the decades. Uh, there was an uh, owner occupant who owned a saloon. Uh, in a different location, uh, various borders of plasterers, cigar makers, basket makers, a brush manufacturer, a fire captain, for example. And the house on the corner um, turned out to be a butcher or a fancy grocer 
from 1863 to 1879, and uh, who had a tin cutter living there. And it was a grocery store. And in fact, by the 1920s, it was a Kroger store uh, on the corner of 11th and Greeno. Right. So we're going to zoom in a little bit on 1048. So if you remember from 1877, this rectangle was the house. By 1886, he has put multiple additions on the back. And two means two story. So this was a frame two story addition. There's a frame one story addition and another one story addition all the way at the back. And this I think was a porch here on the side. Outhouses, which we excavated, there were three of them uh, in an L shape back here in the corner of the particular lot. So by 1880, Joseph Rush rented the house at 1048 Green up to at least 22 people in seven families. Now Rush and his family lived at the Five Mile House. Uh, you have all probably are familiar with the Five Mile House. It was now the barley corns across from Turkey Foot, five miles south of Covington on the Lexington Turnpike. And Joseph Risha owned that for a while um, in the 1880s. So we can look and see how this house has grown and expanded. And here are the list of occupants in 1880s. I just, I find it fascinating that this many people um, lived in that house. And I'll tell you, this is not uncommon for this neighborhood and for most of Covington. If you could rent out a room in your house, they generally rented them out. Uh, it might be as simple as renting a bed to someone. It didn't even have to be a whole room. But in this particular house, we have uh, one, two, three, four, seven families. And the, the ones listed in red, four of these households are headed by widows. So we have Ann Roach with her grandchildren. We have Mary Burns with um, three daughters. Uh, Mary Hoffmeyer with two sons. And Marcy Wilds with a daughter. Although this, she's listed as the head of household, uh, this is the mother and that's the daughter. And we also have two, one older couple and then two younger couples, one with children and one without children. Um, they're all German, Irish, um, native, but they're either German or Irish, uh, for the most part, all living in the same house. Very, very interesting to me, all of this. In the early 20th century, 1913, Elizabeth Carr sold 1048 Greenup Street to Harry and Tilly Siegel, or Seigel is spelled in various ways. They were Russian Jewish immigrants who had immigrated to Covington in 1905. Harry owned a retail shoe store, presumably in the house. Uh, and in 1920, they're listed in the census as follows. Harry Siegel, retail shoe store, uh, Russian uh, Jewish as place of origin, his wife Tilly, their uh, three sons, and a renter, Stanislaus Punchminski, who was a shoe repairer from Poland, who uh, emigrated in uh, 1907. Then, very interesting, at the back of the lot in the outhouses that we excavated, this is these are a few of the shoes that we excavated uh, from their outhouses. And we also uh, got this little coin purse, which has a French coin in the back side of a Russian coin. And there was a big treaty in the 1890s between Russia and France. And we think this is a commemorative from that and probably brought over by one of these immigrants and then lost in the outhouse at some point. So Ben Gessiness, who was also Jewish, um, was also a shoemaker and he and his family lived there uh, until his death. And then they sold it, as I noted earlier, in the 1950s. All right, so there's no real lessons to be learned, for example, from, from some of these. They're just, they're fascinating to me and they illustrate 
all the different things that you can learn uh, about people who may have lived in your house or the property that you're interested in. Um, a few notes here since it's almost 10 after seven on some useful online resources. Um, city directories are available free online at the Cincinnati Public Library for Cincinnati, Covington, and Newport. And I'm gonna show you where that is in a minute. Old maps are also online free at a place website called Historic Map Works, unless you wanna buy them, uh, which you have to pay. Uh, they're free also through most of the local libraries as are the Sanborn fire insurance maps, which this is one of right here. On the Cincinnati uh, Public Library's website, if you go into their collections uh, under digital.cincinnatilibrary.org, there's Sorry, the host keeps muting me. Why am I muted? Can anybody hear me? You're good. Okay, it keeps saying I'm muted. Um, if you look at the white arrow down here, it's pointing to city and county directories. And then we'll go to, if you click on that, we'll go to the next slide. And you'll see down here, it says that for Ohio, they have um, Cincinnati um, and various other uh, individual places, Dayton, Norwood, um, Cleveland. In Kentucky, they have Covington and Newport. And if you click on that, um, it takes you to a list and it gives you the different years and it gives you the time periods and all of the different directories. And you can click on those and they are searchable. You can search by address. You don't have to know the name of the person who lived there. You can search them by, search them by address which is amazing that they're searchable that way. Another one of my favorite websites is called Historic Map Works or Residential Genealogy. Um, you can search this for free uh, anywhere you want. If you click the search button and you can put in the county that you wanna search on. Uh, and then you click search, or you can find a family name on a map. There are all different ways to search. I type in Kenton County, Kentucky, and it comes up with the Boone, Kenton, Campbell County, 1883 uh, historical atlas map. That's the only one uh, for Northern Kentucky. And so you can click on that, and it gives you every page that you can look at. And then you can click on individual pieces of the map. This is Florence, for example. And you can zoom in. Um, it, it's very easy to use. Or you can go to the Kenton County Public Library. And I believe this is, I'm not really sure if you have to have a library card to access these. Some of you do, some of you don't. It has the local Atlas maps available. It has that 1914 map that we looked at earlier. That has various other maps that you can look at that are also uh, of interest locally. It's got the City Atlas of Covington from 1877. And on a different page on their website, you can access the Sanborn fire insurance maps as well. All right. So, Go to your local libraries, other institutions. These are great resources. Ask your local history librarians. Uh, Campbell County Historical Society is another great resource, as of course is the public library. All right. So if we're going to answer our trivia question, hey, Jewel, some people got the answer. Sage got the answer. All right. There were there are only six log houses, including this one that have been documented in Kenton County. I think there are more, a few more at least, but the, there are only six that have been documented. And it's kind of interesting because there are at least 24 known in Campbell County and at least 80 in Boone County. 
So what's so interesting to me and what a wow moment this was is that this is a rare surviving example in Kenton County, and especially because we have a direct connection to a Revolutionary War veteran. It's a single pen, two-story house, um, which is among the oldest types of log dwellings documented in Kentucky. So it, it's very, very interesting to us. Uh, and, and like I said, the research on it is ongoing. Um, part of a project, so very interested. All right, so if anybody has any questions, um, it looks like Sage might have gotten the, I don't know, she might have gotten the first um, answer. And was it originally a duplex? No, um, a lot of these early houses were built with two front doors. If they added onto a log house to begin with, they might not have wanted to cut through the logs on the inside structurally to make an interior access to that other room. So they would have been like two separate rooms accessed by two different doors. And then when they put an addition across the back, then you could access it from the addition by going around. Okay. Yeah, so Joseph Schmidt wants to know if you can share a link to your slideshow. Um, the whole presentation will end up on YouTube, correct? Yes, this um, this entire presentation will be on the Berenger Crawford YouTube page. So you can probably, and our Facebook page as well. So you can probably yes. access it from there and watch it again. Yes. Yes, that, that's why I put them on there um, so that people could, we'll be able to see those links once it gets up on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Yes. Anybody else have any questions? We do have about 15 minutes left. If not, Janine, maybe you want to share how you started um, getting interested in this? Oh my gosh, um, in, in archaeology and history and everything. Huh. It's, it's almost the first thing I ever wanted to do. So, I mean, I was, my family has been involved with Beringer Crawford Museum since I was a child. And so obviously I was interested in a lot of things in that line from then and just decided that was how I was gonna make a living. I went to college and majored in history and so my parents said majored in something you can make a living at. And so I switched to commercial art um, for about a year and then I took an anthropology class and changed my major to anthropology and I said, I'll find a way to make a living because uh, that's what I'm gonna do. And it took, took about six years out of college, but I've been going full-time ever since. So. I have a question, if you, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Um, I uh, know the couple that live in a log cabin on Hands Pike and there's also, I think, a restaurant down in that area uh, that's in a log cabin. Yes, uh, I, I'm not sure if that's Kenton County or not, but are you aware of those two log cabins and are they registered? Yes, those are two of the ones that have been documented. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There's just, there have not been that many either left in Kenton County. I, I know of one down in Southern Kenton County that I don't think has been documented that's inside of a house as well. Uh, so there are certainly more than six. It's just that's all that's been documented. Um, and then Patty Kaiser wants to know when or how will you let um, people know the location of the house? When, I, when we're finished. Um, we're, we're still in the middle of the project and the house is, is going to be moved. So it, it will be saved. Um, it's, it's going to be moved. Um, to become someone else's log house. 
But once it's all finished, then I can talk about it again. Because <laughs> we're going to get to do more research as well, which is the is another fun part of it, besides documenting the house as it comes down. So all very exciting. So do we have any more questions? We have room for um, time for a couple more. All right, very cool. I'll go ahead and close this down. Okay. Um, if there's not any questions, oh, is the whole house being moved or just the log cabin portion? I don't know that yet. It depends on what the other half is built of, is made of, and if it's salvageable. Um, it, it may not be in good enough condition because it's just it's just frame, so it's just wood boards on the other side. So we're hoping the whole thing. They don't know as much of it as they can as can be moved will be moved. Hopefully. It's just part of your job. So do people want log houses? Um, I know, well, documenting them, yes. Researching them, yes. No, I'm not the one who actually dismantles and moves the log houses. In fact, if anybody knows of any companies that do that, we're looking for companies that move log houses. Because we, we have to have, a, a you know, somebody that's, uh, knows how to do that and has experience doing that to do the, the formal taking down and putting back up. We know where it's going. We just have to find someone to do it. So if anybody knows of any companies that move log houses, Woody and Cindy, I'm looking at you wherever you are. Let, let me know because I need to find them soon. Uh, Terry Sawyer. Terry Sawyer. Okay. Yeah. So if you have their contact information, can you send it to me? Yes. Yeah, we will. All right. Thank you. And then I have one other question. I've seen so many old houses have two front doors. Uh -huh. Is there a religious or a reason for that? In this particular case, not religious. I suspect some of it has to do with um, just the, how it's constructed. Um, if the whole, if it's sidewalls are built out of logs, structurally you may not logistically be able to cut a doorway in them. Uh, some of it's to help retain heat in the winter time, so you don't have too many openings. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know exactly. I know that that was the custom in some places, and especially with log buildings, to have separate front doors. Hopefully, that can be part of my research in my next phase. Okay. Ooh, maybe it was to rent out a room. That's actually a good idea. Um, because then you wouldn't have to worry about a renter accessing the rest of your house. That's a good idea. Very cool. Right. So we have time for about one or two more questions, if anybody has one. Family Search just for Kentucky. No, Family Search is the um, entire world, as far as I know. 
I know they have European uh, genealogical information, at least in possibly other parts too, and certainly the whole United States. It's an excellent, excellent resource to go in and explore and figure out how to find your way around in it. Uh, amazing resource of information and free, which is even better. Did landlords regularly rent only one room to tenants? Um, in this particular, the case in Covington, there were seven families. So I'm guessing each family had a room um, in some of the houses down in that part of Covington where they were renting to single men. Uh, a lot of times, they, as far as we could tell, they would be sharing. I mean, they might be renting a bed essentially uh, in, in a corner of a room. Uh, and, and it seems like almost every family, if they could rent out a bed or a room, they did it because that was the way to make a few extra dollars a month, um, you know, to, to either pay their own mortgage or to, um, you know, upkeep on their house. It was very, very common. And the city directories for Covington and Newport are just, especially once you can search them on the Cincinnati Library website then you can really get a good feel of how many people were living in each of these houses. Great question. Um, why would they put shoes in the outhouse? This one was particularly full of shoes. These shoes were all worn out. So if they're the shoe repairer and somebody brings in a pair of shoes and they're not fixable, you know, they put soles. Some of these had three or four soles on the bottom where they'd obviously repaired them multiple times. And they just got to a point where they weren't wearable anymore. And, and I guess instead of the person taking them back home, the shoe repairer just kept them and threw them away. But they threw them all in, in the outhouse. There were many dozens of shoes, all, all sizes, children, men's, women's, um, that were down in there. It was not pretty. <laughs> okay, so um, that's about all we have time for tonight. So I would like to remind everyone that uh, the museum is temporarily closed right now until February 12th as we take down our current holiday exhibits and we prepare for our new art exhibits, which are Spirit Riders by Naomi Bradford and Abracadabra by Greg Harper. Those are going to run through February, February 12th through April 24th. And you can find more details coming soon at our website, bcmuseum.org. Um, we are also always looking for volunteers and new members for the museum. Um, so I would, love for all of you to go learn more at our website as well if you're interested in becoming a member or helping volunteering um, here um, you can volunteer with like education programs um, at different exhibits with all different things we're always looking for volunteers so if that's something you're interested in um, please check out our website and find more information there um, so that is all we have for tonight. Thanks again to our sponsors and our supporters of the Berender Crawford Museum. We'd also like to thank our staff, the trustees and members of um, BCM. For more Northern Kentucky history through the week, you can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, where you can find the latest installments of our curators chat with our curator of collections, Jason French. Um, please like and subscribe those. There will not be a Northern Kentucky History Hour next week as we continue our bi-weekly schedule, but we will be back on Wednesday, January 26th with, with Dave Schroeder on the history of women and religion in the Northern Kentucky area. So until then, take care, everyone, and good night. Thanks for coming. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.